The, uh, the next event on our program is a little bit different than what we've seen so far. Um, a lot of people um, have expressed interest in teaching with proof assistants or have taught with proof assistants. Um, this has been done in, you know, by many people around the world in computer, uh, sorry, in computer science. Um, but we're slowly seeing more mathematicians picking up proof assistants and teaching with them. So we wanted to have a uh, um, sort of a panel discussion. The idea is we have six panelists who will each present a very brief introduction into what they've taught the audience, they've taught to um, the materials they've used. Um, and we tried to get people with the, the range of backgrounds. So people from math, people from CS, people who've taught logic, um, other topics. Um, We'll get a short introduction from each, and then we should have a big chunk of time for the crowd to ask questions um, of specific panelists or of everybody at once. Uh, and hopefully we'll learn sort of what materials are out there, what techniques have worked, what techniques have not worked um, for those of us who are interested in doing this in the future. So um, our six panelists, we'll, we'll go in this order. We have uh, Jasmine Blanchette, Jeremy Avigad, Julien Nabu, Heather Macbeth, uh, Gihan Marsinga, and Patrick Masso. Um, so, Jasmine, if you're ready, I see you. Yep, okay. you're there. Um, <laughs> take it away. Thank you very much. Yes, so I don't even have a slide, so I'm going to uh, let it on several. So, I'm going to just uh, do this very brief introduction to logical verification. So, that's the title of the course. It's really an interactive theory improving or proof assistant course, master's level at the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam, but it's also shared with the, uh, the other university in Amsterdam. Um, we get about 40 students per year, roughly, let's say 50 at the beginning of the term, 40 at the end. Uh, and it's mostly CS students, a few math students, and we even had a philosopher this time. And I think uh, he's even around for this event. Uh, but he's the only of my students that I saw in the, in the, in the Zoom list. Uh, so, um, my goals with the course is not to teach lean, but rather to teach, you know, fundamental IVP techniques uh, to, you know, develop some, some, some skills and, and also get to learn some basic concepts that are useful across all proof assistants, like tactics, uh, proofs and so on, backward proofs, forward proofs, their correspondence with informal proofs. And, but so, so lean is the vehicle, lean is not the goal, but it's a, it's a nice vehicle for the students because it has this nice integration in Visual uh, Studio uh, code and is, you know, very modern uh, and so on. And it's based on dependent type theory, which means that if you go to simple type theory later, you feel more at home than if, if you travel the other direction. And the course has the Hitchhiker's Guide to Logical Verification as its uh, lecture notes. Uh, so many of you uh, know about them because they're, they're used and cited, uh, they're, they're used as a lean tutorial, even though they were not designed as a lean tutorial, um, because they don't teach idiomatic lean, they, they teach, you know, what I want the students to know, uh, you know, in some fragment of, of lean, um, but it's a kind of weird fragment in some sense. Uh, they ha we have exercise sheets, homework sheets. Uh, and there's a final exam at the end and a, a reset exam. And my, my overall philosophy is always to teach, you know, I mean, to show examples, have practical uh, applications before theory. So at first we cover a little bit of, of uh, simple type theory, just so that we can, you know, <laughs> understand the, the basic syntax of lean. And then in the third lecture, we see Curry Howard and we see dependent types for the first time. In lecture 11, we see universes, we see choice, uh, subtypes, quotient types, and etc. So, you know, lots of the, uh, you know, logical material that you don't really need every day um, is, is postponed to the end of the course, you know, instead of, of starting with the, the theory and then going to the practice. Uh, we're almost exclusively using tactics, uh, sometimes with some halves in there, uh, so kind of forward style sometimes. But uh, there's also one lecture on backward proofs where we, uh, you know, look at proof terms. And that's also where we look at Curry Howard. Um, and so the first half of the course is really the basics of functional programming. Uh, we reach metaprogramming at the end of that so that students can write little extensions. And then we move on to uh, semantics of programming languages and uh, then some mathematics as well. So uh, 
culminating with the construction of the reels and a guest lecture by, uh, by, by Rob uh, about the piatics, uh, but not so much the mathematics of them, but how they're represented in Lean. I think that's it. I don't know if it's too short or too long. I think that's perfect. Uh, okay, good. No harm in being short. I, I, I think that's exactly on that uh, yeah. the faster the better. Um, yeah, so thank you. Let, we're going to postpone questions until after all the panelists have said their intro bit. So uh, Jeremy, are you ready to go? You're muted. Sorry, okay, I'm there. unmuted now. I'm sharing unmuted. my screen. Okay, and let's see. Okay. Um, so yeah, let me know if, if you have trouble hearing me. Um, but so if the question is, you know, should you use uh, lean in teaching? I, 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 I highly recommend it. Uh, you know, students uh, enjoy it and they get instant feedback and it's fun to do. Um, the uh, lean community pages has a, a list of a number of resources. Um, I just want to mention, you know, a, a, a couple that I've been involved with. Uh, so, you know, I'm touched that the improving in Lean is, is has proved to be such a uh, a useful resource uh, on Zulip. Uh, in fact, that was first developed uh, for teaching. I, you know, I used it to teach dependent type theory and and Lean. Uh, and so, you know, the advantage of that is that it, it gives you an account of of what's going on in Lean from the bottom up. So it explains what types are and lambdas and pies and inductive types and cases and so on. Um, and so, you know, if you want students to really understand how, what's going on in the foundation, how the system works, that's a good choice. Uh, on the negative side, it, it really has very little to do with, with really substantive formalization. It doesn't, uh, it was written well before MathLib existed. Um, and it, you know, has nothing to do with MathLib theories and tactics and so on. Um, at the start of the pandemic, uh, Kevin, Rob, and Patrick and I uh, started working on uh, uh, another resource called Mathematics and Lean, which I'm also um, very fond of. Um, it's, it's still in progress, but you know, there, there are 60 pages there already, uh, and you know, we plan to come back to it, uh, hopefully like uh, this summer. Uh, but that focuses on formalizing, on, on using MathLib and formalizing mathematics as quickly as possible. Uh, and that builds on materials that I think Patrick will probably talk about. Um, so I, what I want to talk about now, what I want to focus on is yet another uh, resource that uh, I developed with Rob and uh, Rob Lewis and Flores Van Dorn, uh, work called Logic and Proof that we use to teach a course in uh, an introduction to symbolic logic, uh, informal mathematical reasoning, and formal proof. Um, and it's really intended for starting students, uh, you know, possibly in math or computer science, but you know, we've had even at philosophy majors and business majors, it doesn't assume anything uh, beyond high school mathematics. Uh, and the idea is really just to teach students how to write, you know, rigorous, how to, how to speak mathematical language and how to write ordinary mathematical proofs uh, on the one hand. At the same time, we try to teach them the rudiments of symbolic logic, you know, propositional logic and first order logic and quantifiers and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, along the way, we teach students to use lean, uh, but it's really, the course is not about lean. It's really about writing um, informal proof and writing, uh, you know, and then using formal symbolism, formal logic. Um, and kind of to forestall objections, I'm not saying that, um, you know, the, 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 the strands are largely independent. So I, I'm not saying that you need to teach students logic, you know, to make them good mathematicians. Uh, and conversely, you can teach logic without, you know, without, uh, without teaching, you know, mathematical, ordinary mathematical proof or much, you know, much proof um, at all. Um, and, you know, you can teach lean without, without either and vice versa. Uh, but the point is that these are all good things for students to see. Um, and, you know, when you do them together, there are some sy synergies that, uh, that emerge. Um, so as far as kind of informal proof, I mean, here's the kind of thing that, you know, that we want students to do. So this, you know, this is a question that appeared on a homework right after we, we talked about equivalence. We tell students what an equivalence relation is, uh, you know, you give them some examples, you know, on the assignment, uh, you know, you, you say, here's what the equivalence class of A is, it's the set of elements that are equivalent to A, right? And then you ask them to show that, uh, that the equivalence class of A is equal to the equivalence class of B, if and only if A is equivalent to B. Um, and you know, this is the kind of uh, answer you get from students. Assume the equivalent classes are equal. This means that the set of elements in A, uh, C that is equivalent to A, they're equivalent to B. This everything that's equivalent to A is also equivalent to B, but by transitivity, you know, A is equivalent to C and C is equivalent to B implies that A is equivalent to B. I mean, this doesn't quite work. I mean, you really to know, need to know that there's at least one thing that's equivalent to A uh, and, you know, taking A is, would be a good choice. Um, but, you know, this kind of illustrates that, 
you know, these are the kinds of things that students do when they're learning how to write proofs. And you know, this isn't bad. It's uh, uh, it's it's not perfect. But these are the try to skills that you're trying to you know get them to to uh, to master. I mean, for another example, you know, after talking about injective and surjective functions, a homework problem asks them to show that uh, if G composed with F is injective, uh, then F is injective. Right. And then the second part of the problem asked them to show that, uh, you know, you can have G composed without being injective without G being injective. Um, but, you know, here's another student answer, uh, assume G composed with F is injective, you know, then by definition for all A and B, we have that G composed. So this is one thing that students often do, right? They'll just state the definition and, you know, we go out of the way to tell them you don't, you know, just use the definition. And if you use it correctly, you don't have to tell us that you know the definition. Um, I also, you know, we also tell students not to use these, these logical arrows, just use, use natural language, uh, try to avoid logical symbolism. Um, and here, you know, but the, the proof isn't, is, again, it's not bad, it's not great. I mean, they start by saying, assume that there exists some X and Y in X such that F of X is equal to Y. And what they really mean is let X and Y be arbitrary elements of X and so on. Um, so again, it, you know, these are examples of, of, you know, students learning how to write proofs and doing it okay, but not great. Um, and so the hope is that by teaching them formal um, proof at the same time, you know, you get some kind of synergy between them, right? So here's another example of on the formal side. So there's a homework assignment that tells, says what it means for two sets to be disjoint, right? They have no elements in common and we represent it that way. And the homework assignment gives them a couple of examples of, you know, how to use disjointness. Uh, and then the, home, the, the problem says, you know, assuming A and B are disjoint and C is a subset of A and D is a subset of B, so that C and D are disjoint. Right. And then the homework, you know, this is there's a sorry right here and the students have to fill it in. And here a student did. Right. So pick an arbitrary X. Suppose X is in C and D. Uh, well, because C is a subset of A, X is in A. And because D is a subset of B, then it's in B. But because A and B are disjoint, that, that's a contradiction. Um, and here is exactly, you know, the injective problem. Um, and uh, again, you know, you see that they do pretty well. I mean, so again, this is just given as a sorry and the students have to fill it in. And here they say, you know, let X1 and X2 be arbitrary. Suppose F of X1 equals F of X2. Um, then G of F of X1 equals G of F of X2. And then by injectivity, X1 is equal to X2, right? And here's a similar problem with surjective functions. And, you know, they get used to that, you know, exists elimination means that if you know that there is uh, some X such that G composed with F of X is equal to Z, well, then you just say, you know, let pick an arbitrary such X, suppose that, and then, and then use it. Um, so, you know, if the question is, does this really help them write informal proofs better? Um, the answer is, I, I don't know. To be honest, I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, they're both worthwhile things to do, and it, it, it can't hurt. Um, and so we, we do it. Um, so the final side is uh, just the general comments is, you know, it's, it's a funny course in that we're teaching them to do three different things. We're teaching them to write mathematical proof. We're trying to use symbolic logic. We're teaching them to use lean. But we tell them that there are three different things. They don't get them confused. They can switch context and so on. Um, it seems to help, or at least not to hurt, to, to do all three at once. And it's actually teaching-wise, it's, it's enjoyable to skip around. Uh, you know, you get bored with one thing, you just move to, to another. Um, and students uh, like the course, you know, they, they, some of them love using lean, some of them, uh, most of them just, you know, tolerate it at least, uh, very few of them, you know, just, just violently dislike it. Um, but it, you know, it, the course, it, it doesn't feel like, uh, you know, three disjoint things. It really does fit, fit together and students uh, 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 seem to do just fine with it. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Jeremy. Um, I think next on our list is uh, Julian. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I see a question in the chat, by the way, asking if slides are available. So if our speakers would like to make their slides available on Zulip, um, I'm sure that would be appreciated. OK, so uh, I'm using ITP in different courses. Um, so I'm using it in logic in the second year. Uh, for doing proof in uh, natural deduction. And I'm using a tool called Educera, uh, which is like a formalization of natural deduction uh, that you can use by uh, point and click. I have also a course for fourth year students where I teach uh, ITP uh, per se. So I, I teach inductive types, uh, career words, and things like that. 
And uh, we have uh, also a fifth year uh, course, which is like a software foundation style. Uh, I'm not using the software foundation book, but we are teaching like the same thing, uh, semantics or logics and things like that. But I think in this audience, you are more interested in teaching math. So I will tell you about my experience is the uh, course, which is very similar to what uh, Jeremy uh, just talked about. We are doing exactly the same exercises about uh, injective, subjective functions. So it's first year students in Strasbourg. There are between 200 or 400 students and we are using uh, Educare. Uh, so we, we deal with, when I say sets, it's just a vocabulary of sets, in intersection, union, things like that. What is a lemma? What is a, because to tell you about when I start my second year lecture uh, in logic, I ask the student, what is a lemma and what is an axiom? And you can see that half of them could pass the first year of math curriculum and not knowing what is a lemma or an axiom. So I we, we felt the need to, to add a course like that. Uh, and it all started like that. It was uh, one of my mathematician colleagues complaining that he had some, what we call the LSD trip proof that uh, Tobias Nico called. Uh, so people writing nonsense and then complaining that they don't get any points. So he said, can, can we use Coq in the first year? And I am not... Uh, as brave as you are. And I said, no, uh, we can't use Coq for the first year student because I think it takes time to learn the tactics, the purification and so on. And we only need 20 hours to teach them how to write a proof. So I decided to use a tool called uh, Educare. So I will just tell you. Um, and, and the idea of the, the course is um, uh, to teach a structure of proof by giving all the rules, like when you teach chess, maybe you, you explain the rules before playing the game. Uh, whereas uh, uh, this, I, I found this uh, old talk by Kuhn. <laughs> we were already uh, saying that, that uh, the tradition in math is to learn how to write a proof by uh, imitation of what the teacher does. So the idea is to to give the rules of uh, uh, logic, but it's not a course in logic, it's just the rules of reasoning. And so what is Educare? Uh, in a word, it's like, if you know Scratch for programming language, it's a Scratch of uh, ITP. So it's a purely uh, point and click user interface. You don't have to learn its syntax. And uh, you, it's not a professional system. You cannot prove the four color theorem in Educare. Um, it's built up uh, on top of Coq, so it's Coq running inside a browser uh, with a nice user interface. So it's a web service, so it's easy. You don't have to, the student can use it in the web browser. Uh, it's a point and click user interface. And um, uh, the proof language is something in between Isabel and uh, LCF style prover. So you have a proof text but the interaction is uh, equivalent to giving some tactics. So the clicks user uh, uh, pointing to clicks uh, uh, are equivalent to typing tactics, but you see only the proof text. Uh, you can work in forward chaining style or backward chaining, uh, but the proof text is always displayed in um, forward chaining. So if you do a backward chaining uh, step, it will just uh, modify the proof step to, to draw a, a backward chaining style. Uh, and it's also use a pragmatic use of automation. So uh, you cannot build any theory inside Educare. You need the exercise to be there before to have been built by the, the, the developer of the system. And so you have a uh, some uh, automation built in to solve the, the boring uh, sub goals. Um, in the course, we give natural deduction rules, but not using uh, inference rules. We just use French words. And we also give some less fine grained rules inspired by coherent logic. So uh, one step in this formalism correspond to a usual step in a mathematician standard reasoning. So 
So for instance, if you apply, if you have a, a lemma with three assumptions and showing something, then you don't need, uh, you don't need a several application of all elimination, uh, uh, implication elimination and so on. You can do uh, everything in one step. It looks like this. So you have a, here, for instance, you have the proof of, um, so we do proof by induction. We do proof about injective and surjective function. And here it's an example of proof by induction of the sum of uh, integrals. Um, what is the output? So what is good is we have good student involvement. So we start this course early in the semester and uh, we can make them work a lot on this online exercises. So they do hundreds of exercises that they wouldn't have done on paper. Uh, but sometimes we have seen risk of random point and click strategy. So when, when, when the exercises are simple, they try to solve it by uh, brute forcing or by copying on each other and so on. And also what is more surprising to us is that they, they, they develop a competence to solve the exercise inside the ITP system. And then they have difficulties in the paper and pencil proof. So we have seen like them solving the, uh, the, the problem in the ITP and having problems in the exams for exactly the same example. Uh, what we think maybe the reason is that when they are using the system, they don't have to uh, remember about the statement. So I had, for instance, in my last exam, they failed to do, uh, I think I gave exactly the example that Jeremy has shown about the composition of two functions. One is injective and you show that the other one is injective or something like that. And uh, many failed to give the good definition of injectivity. So I think maybe a system where they have to, to know the definition may be helpful. So um, as Jeremy said, we, we don't know if it is helping. So we are using it, but we have some feeling. I have some colleagues that think that it's useless. I have some mathematician colleagues that will say, uh, we should do problem solving, interesting math, and not this boring, uh, exercise and logic. So not everybody in the department likes it. And uh, so I'm trying now to build a research project in math education with some specialists of the use of logic in math teaching. And uh, we want to try to evaluate if it really helps. Uh, I think in this audience, people are convinced that using ITP helps, but uh, I think outside this small group, uh, it's not clear. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, next on the list is Heather. Uh, Heather, are you here? Uh, yes. Uh, so I teach uh, at Fordham, which is a small university in New York City. And uh, it's uh, a university that has small class sizes and prides itself on sort of very close uh, teacher-student interaction. Um, so uh, I, I state that as sort of a, a precursor because I think it's easier to do this kind of thing there than in classes where you have very big class sizes and less of a requirement to spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with your students. I've made a couple of experiments using uh, interactive theorem proving with, uh, with teaching, in both cases with the teaching of real analysis. Um, the first time I was teaching just a couple of students who had missed the regular class on real analysis and wanted to do a, a catch-up course privately, and since they were both interested in computer science, I, 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 I decided that we would do it simultaneously with teaching them clock. And then a second experiment that I made was uh, teaching a regularly scheduled course on real analysis with about 20 students with a layer of lean on top as a purely optional component. So just a regular course on real analysis with a little uh, advertisement from me at the start of the course about lean and how great it was. And then after that, you know, optional, uh, you know, examples provided to sort of translate into lean some things that we were covering in the course at various times and optional pro problems on the homework sets for which the students could get uh, extra credit to replace doing other problems, but which the vast majority of their, their classmates skipped entirely. 
So I want to suggest this model if you're interested in experimenting with using a, a theorem prover in your courses, but are not willing to, to go the whole way to, to, to teaching a course with the, the theorem proving mandatory for the students. You can get take up from some students, the most enthusiastic ones, just by making it optional. So I see I've got a couple of my guinea pigs in the audience today, Benjamin and Andrew. Um, so I want to maybe just uh, screen share with some of the materials that I used for my second course. This was the, 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 the full scale real analysis course. So you can see the kinds of things that I would do. And one thing I would say is that when you're making it optional, you sort of don't even really need to teach the theorem proving to the students. You, uh, so I, I told my students, okay, there's this wonderful resource also in real analysis written by Patrick Masson. You can go off and, and read it and, uh, and learn lean yourself. And then uh, I somehow just taught the students by, by this and by demonstrating some examples and by at the start giving exercises that were sufficiently close to the examples I'd given that they could be picked up by trial and error and personal discussion with me. And I think this works if you have relatively small classes. So let me just briefly share screen and show a few of my materials. Can you see? Yes. Uh, so this is the first thing I showed my students. It was the first or second week of class. We had just studied the supremum in our real analysis course and done some silly facts like the, if you add a number to a set, then, uh, then the supremum goes up by that number. And then I, uh, I took the entire class, this was my advertisement lecture, through the same proof in Koch and, and uh, sorry, in Lean. And we, um, and we observed together as I was narrating step by step that it really felt exactly like the, the pen and paper proof that I had given in, in the previous lecture. Um, and I provided a, I mean, so most of, some of these are, are, um, are, are example files. In the next week, I provided an example file proving, you know, the, how to prove that uh, the, the limit of the sum is the sum of the limit. And then as the exercise for that week, I gave a very, very similar example the first time to prove that um, if you multiply a sequence by a constant, then, then the limit changes by that constant. And this, you might think, would be kind of a surprising first exercise, like maybe too hard, given that, I mean, you know, I, I never really officially taught them lean or theorem proving or anything. I just, you know, gave them an example and, and told them to go off and play with it. But many of them could sort of learn by picking up some of the techniques in this example here. They, they came to my office hours, they asked questions, they, they went through Patrick's tutorials and, and it was sort of not impossible for the enthusiasts. And then the same later on, you'll see there's a big gap between week six and week 11 because I never bothered developing Riemann integration. I think that that's something that is much harder than the other contents of a standard uh, real analysis course to, to do in, in, in formalization. So we, we went on hiatus and then came back when it came to uniform co convergence. The one thing I would say is that you only get take up from a relatively small portion of your class by this method. I think that the way to get higher involvement is to be extremely present in the very first weeks of the semester. I was sort of, I was blindsided when I did this myself. And there were several students who I think were interested and who with a bit more of a helping hand in the first couple of weeks would have joined the core of students that, uh, that were trying these exercises as it was only two out of 20 of the students did the, the, the lean exercises, but that was really right from the start of the, the, the class. So only two out of, out of 20. The ones who gave up, gave up right at the start. So I think if you want to bring more students involved, the trick is to be really, really present, not necessarily with formal instruction, but with tons of office hours and personal outreach just at the beginning. And that gets people on board. Uh, and that's all. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's a great takeaway message. Um, so next is uh, Jihan, are you here? Yes. Oh. OK, so let's make sure I'm doing that. So can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. Looks good. Uh, yeah, uh, so I've uh, maybe just stolen Kevin's Xena and changed it to Xlean or something. So yeah, we've got Xlean, 
beginners teaching lean in Exeter because we're, we're all kind of beginners there. so there's me and I've got some uh, undergraduates uh, helping out there's Omar and James who I think they're here okay so uh hopefully the Dr Strangelove reference is is not too prophetic of what's happening right now uh but yeah so what's my background so analytic number theory uh, a colleague at the University of Bristol, where I was at the time, uh, showed me this thing called Haskell, which I thought was quite fun. Uh, and I, th I thought I'd do some projects with school children using Haskell. We did, looked at the Huffman compression algorithm, Dijkstra's algorithm, and a tautology checker. And I thought, oh, Haskell, it seems to be uh, really good for helping students understand mathematics. And it, uh, certainly uh, you're not going to make type errors, which I think I, I just see so much with students just not, you know maybe thinking of sets as being the same as propositions etc cetera, etc cetera, you know the union of things is the same as the uh, as a disjunction you know union of two sets is the same as a disjunction or something which, which is not um so i gradually started introducing more and more formal logic into my introductory proof course for first year undergraduates at the university of exeter uh and the more i did this the more i thought oh this type theory thing sounds interesting so i read this book uh, type theory in, or didn't read the whole thing, started reading it, type theory in full uh, proof. And um, so a former student of mine when I was teaching at the University of Oxford was actually a graduate student of Jeremy's. And um, so I, I through, through that, I found out that there was this logic and proof book. I thought, oh, wow, this is, this is brilliant. This is, this is the way to, to understand what's going on. Uh, so yeah, so, I, so my, my intro to Lean was really not through interactive theorem proving it was as a way to to understand uh, logic really and to, to teach logic um but, but let me add that that uh, rob and flores are co-authors oh so sorry yes okay, i realized that yes. that might have pushed pushed uh, this maybe they didn't fit on the slide but, but okay they were, yes they are co-authors yeah sorry jeremy rolled flores as well yeah um uh i'll i'll, I'll, I'll change the slides later Okay, yeah, so uh, I thought that was that was brilliant. And um, uh, so yeah, I started playing around with it. I, I did formalize something just to get myself into into lean. So I don't know if you've if you know this book, Gödel, Escher, Bach. So uh, in this book, Douglas Hofstadter has this particular formal system, MIU, and the question is, can you uh, you know, can, can you produce this this string M MU in this system? And the answer is no, and there's a yeah. So there's a decision procedure and I thought, well, let's try doing that. Okay, anyway, so that's how I got into lean. Okay, so uh, I thought, what, what are the issues with a traditional, at least British math, maths, math, maths, education? Uh, so certainly here in the UK, uh, high school maths is, is generally about applying algorithms to calculate numerical algebraic quantities. So most beginning undergraduates have no experience of reasoning. You know, they think maths is about doing calculations. Uh, so how do you actually help students to understand what proofs are? Well, at some universities, you know, the Oxbridge model say you've got uh, resource heavy tutoring, you know, the student tries something, you, uh, you then correct their proof. Um, and, and even with that model, it, it does, the, 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 the correction doesn't necessarily uh, converge to a correct proof. You know, the, the student usually doesn't get the opportunity to revisit their proof and, and rewrite it until you can tell that it's correct. Uh, so there are so there are two possible issues. One is that students actually think, "Oh, I don't know how to prove things." Um, that's a bad the bad thing. Even worse, though, is the student thinking, "I do know how to prove things, and they're wrong." Um, and I certainly see a lot of that. Okay, so uh, right, and, and of course, yeah, I'm not going to go into how lean fixes this. I think it should be obvious what, how lean fixes this. But anyway, it's, oh, sorry, I've gone too far. I've gone backwards. Okay, yeah. Okay, anyway, so what's my, uh, so the first course in pure maths that uh, we teach at the University of Exeter, there's an autumn term and a winter term. I've, I've taught the autumn term. So this is what's in, what's I, what I just taught them. So there's uh, some prop proposition on predicate logic, a bit of natural numbers, you know, what, what is it, what is a natural, natural number, addition, multiplication, etc., induction, sets, functions, complex numbers, it had to go somewhere. That's why it's in there. Uh, real numbers, sequences, and series. So very similar to a lot of the things that have been discussed uh, already by, by by the other people talking here. I won't talk about the winter term, but that's what's happening right now. Uh, so my, what's my cohort? So my cohort is about 260 first year undergraduates, so quite a large uh, cohort. Most of them are taking straight maths, but at the University of Exeter, we also have many joint honours and maths with unfortunately business style uh, programmes. 
Okay, uh, so how did I uh, how did I prepare for lean? So I totally rewrote the course to to, to make it more lean friendly. So I'm not talking about sets anymore. I'm talking about types. I'm sure my colleagues are not happy with that, but there we are. Um, and uh, so I, I rewrote all of my blackboard proofs so that every logical step was justified by an introduction or an elimination rule. And I started using you know, la the language of things like goals and, and context. And you see, it, it's, what's, it's fun to see, you know, students chatting in their social media about oh, proofs with many goals. And I'm thinking, this is hilarious. <laughs> this is not something, a term I didn't even encounter before starting this. And, and now it's it's something that is, it's just a part of their natural discourse. Okay, uh, and so I had some some of my own online lean sessions and then we had the proof skill sessions run by uh, James and Omar, uh, who, you know, I mean, it's really good to have actual undergraduates talking to other undergraduates because I, you know, I think it's, it's, it's much closer to, to where they are. And uh, and we've also got a, a Discord server. I think you know James helped set set that up, and he's very active in that. And uh, uh, so I'll, I'll go into that in a bit. Okay, so oh, there's so many things in the chat. I guess I'll have to come back to that afterwards. Okay, so here's just an example. So, yeah, I've got no lean in this talk at all. Uh, so this is an example of the the how I adapted my exercises. For example, so this is a problem sheet. Um, uh, and what I've done here is I've, oh, so, so yeah, I suppose this is an example of doing proof by cases. Right, so you meant to prove this, this proposition. And I've started, yeah, so I start, started using these labeled, uh, labeled statements for one thing and uh, yeah, terminology like in implication introduction. And it, so these, and these are, these, these colored bars are effectively sorries, I guess. So that's, that's that. Okay, so, uh, get through this quickly. Yeah, so what were the logistics of doing this? I chose to use CoCalc uh, partly because I got some money, so might as well spend it on something. Uh, so CoCalc is, I, I know, uh, so you might have heard of CoCalc, it was, it's, um, it's, a, it's a kind of cloud computing service run by William Stein, uh, you know, the, sa the sage, sage man, and uh, and what, yeah, so why, why did I use CoCalc? One, one thing, there's no installation, I guess. So, so if I've got 260 students, how do I get them all to be able to use uh, Lean? I can't get, you know, I can't get them all to install Visual Studio Code. So uh, I thought, yeah, this is, this, is, this is a no installation way of doing it. It is slower than a local installation and sometimes it, it crashes. I think it depends upon what the server load is on, on CoCalc. So that's, that's an issue. Uh, so what I what I actually developed, I developed uh, about forty lean problem sheets, looking at all of those topics that we we discussed, and I've started on writing some lecture notes in the style of mathematics in lean, as well. Okay, so let's just move on. Uh, oh yeah, so so back to the high school where I had been working with the kids doing uh, Haskell. So I this this year. It was very difficult because I was doing it online rather than face to face. Uh, so I've got a six. I had a six week project with those kids. Um, we started with uh, the natural number game, and then we moved on to some of those algebra of limits results that Heather was talking about. Uh, these are these are bright kids, and that's, so so they can. Uh, I still don't know how. Yeah, and they they had already seen these results uh, with another another of their teachers. And I don't know how well they understood it because they had just started. Literally just started. Yeah, they were like 16 year olds and they, they'd been they'd been they'd seen some of these epsilon you know halving epsilon proofs and I, I don't know to what extent they understood it but we did it in lean okay so uh so, yeah so that's that okay so i so said what did what did we learn so for the brits out there there's something well no for the non-brits out there there's something called marmite uh, marmite is a yeast extract and some people really love this yeast extract and some people do not, and this is this is a known fact. Uh, and, and this was the case with with lean. Uh, pa perhaps there was much more of a violent reaction with people not liking lean uh, for this large for this large cohort. So, so some of them really didn't didn't like it. Maybe. Some of them. Why am I doing learning three programming languages at the beginning of my undergraduate degree, etc. So uh, the natural number game. Uh, really, I think helped for for some students making it more manageable. So rather than having to learn, and I think this edu edu care is something to look into as well because it's it just 
it just helps to focus the students on particular things that they need to look at rather than having to learn lots of things, which can be a bit overwhelming. Uh, what we discovered, and this is something definitely that James and Omar did a lot of, was it's better to teach a mathematical topic informally first and later in lean, because learning the syntax and the math simultaneously is very hard. As I said, the students have, uh, it really surprised me that they, the students have adopted this language that I myself didn't know a few months ago, like goals and introduction and elimination rules. Uh, some of the things that, yeah, to, you know, to the extent to which I've actually understood the, understood the distinction and the extent to which uh, lean just makes them unable to deal with things is, is yeah, extensionality for function. What does it mean to say two functions are equal? So the notion of two functions being equal is not something that's really discussed at school because of course, uh, you know, I think students think of a function as a rule, but of course there's more than just rule. You've got a, like a domain and a codomain. What does it mean for two sets to be equal? I think this is not, this is, this is something that actually is really, really challenging, I think for, for beginning undergraduates. Gapped proofs, uh, which, which I showed you some of in Lean or otherwise, I think really helps students say, you know, there's positive feedback on that. And I think, uh, was it Julien who said this about the tactic mode to maybe be too helpful? Yeah, uh, so I think, yeah. So, so the experience, my experience, and maybe the, uh, maybe the student's experience is that uh, it can be too helpful, right? You can, you, can, you can do a proof without necessarily understanding uh, what's going on in your proof because because uh, Lean does such a brilliant job of telling you what the context is at every stage in your proof so you don't need to have the entire proof in your head. On the other hand, there is another hand, it does actually help you to write, to write proofs. Uh, so maybe you start writing a proof and you think, oh, well, I, well I, I don't know, I don't know how to do this bit so I'll I'll have a sorry here, or I'll, I'll, I'll hide that off as a lemma. So you can tell whether your proof is structurally correct, uh, which is maybe harder to do in handwritten proofs. You can say, oh, okay, this is structurally correct. I've just got a few things to fill in. And then you go back and fill those things in. So that was my experience. And now finally, maybe I'm gonna sh uh, share something. So I've got an exam happening right now. So I'll find out to what extent the students have understood the material. And they're already chatting about this on Discord. So I'm gonna share, uh, this so this I should, is I should note we're, we're well behind schedule so okay so I'll, so this is it so the, the module is called 1001 the student has written uh I'm better, I'm better at the module in lean than handwritten and this is yeah so there we are so yeah so who knows whether people understand whether it helps to transfer to maths or not okay that's it I'll stop Great. uh very nice thanks uh so Patrick you're our last speaker You're muted, is that intentional? Patrick, should we be hearing you? Uh, uh, oh. No, you can hear me. Yeah, sorry, so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm Patrick Mosso. I've been uh, teaching using Lean in, uh, in Orsay uh, last year and the previous year. The title of my course is Computer Assisted Logic and Proofs, and I have got uh, 50 students uh, that are enrolled in a, a double major degree in math and computer science and, and they are selected. I mean, you, you, you cannot enter this degree uh, randomly, so they are better than the average French university student, but they are not elite students. Uh, I think, for instance, uh, Kevin's students at Imperial are probably uh, much better, uh, but they are good students. And uh, the course is during the second semester. And the first semester, they, they do uh, calculus and real analysis. But the, the, the weird part is, uh, so the teacher is doing epsilon delta and proving everything with epsilon delta on the blackboard during the lectures. But then during the exercise session, they are mostly computing stuff, computing limits, computing derivatives. And they are, they are never asked to use epsilon and deltas during exams. And, and so they, they don't understand uh, anything uh, about that. And, uh, and as, um, uh, as uh, Julien proved that they are meant to learn the rule of the game by uh, imitation or, or by intimidation, depending on your point of view. And uh, so I, I see them uh, 12 times for uh, two hours of, uh, in the computer lab. And uh, so the, I see uh, one group of 20 students. And last year, for the second iteration of the course, I also had a colleague uh, who saw the other uh, half of the student. And that colleague is not using Lean at all outside of this course. And I think this is pretty interesting. I mean, he heard me talking about my experiment uh, two years ago. 
And he was curious to try to do that. And so he learned how to do the exercises in the, in the course, but he, he, he never went on the leap or formalized anything except the exercises, the proofs of the exercises. So of course he, he likes computers, but he's not uh, into formalized math. So the goal of the course is to improve understanding and production of traditional proofs on paper. The goal is not to learn uh, to be, become a lean expert or learn type theory or, or learn logic, like first order logic or, or whatever. I, I, I never say first order logic or anything like this. And I never say introduction rule or elimination rule uh, or dependent type, or anything like that. And at the end of the course, nobody mentioned that, but uh, maybe because there are, were optional stuff sometimes, but at the end of the course, there is an exam and uh, and they, I, I assess both uh, lean proofs because they've been doing it all semester long uh, and uh, paper proof. So they, they need to write on paper uh, whatever they prove uh, with lean. So the technology stack is so I'm using lean and mathlib, but from mathlib, I, I'm using basically the definition of real numbers, but I, I could sorry that. And, uh, but I, uh, I use, I mean, I could axiomatize real numbers, uh, but I'm using the tactics. Uh, uh, I mean, the computing tactics, Riffle, Norm, Num, Ring, and Abel, uh, that are all wrapped into one custom tactic that I call compute. And, uh, and I use lean arrays for a lot, but so this is on the lean side. So for instance, if lean4 had uh, those uh, five tactics tomorrow, I could switch to lean4 this year. I'm not using anything else. And, uh, and the computer lab has VS code installed with a local installation of lean. And uh, I also created those bundles, uh, lean, bundled lean and matlib where you can download one folder, I mean, one zip file, uh, unzip it on your computer and just get uh, running uh, for this course. But I also uh, put everything on CoCalc and on my web page using the JavaScript version. So the students have the choice and. Uh, and of course, it's I mean, VS Code is more convenient than CoCalc, which is more convenient than JavaScript. But, uh, and especially during the lockdown, uh, they continued. So last year, half the course was during lockdown. Uh, so they used uh, all those uh, technology. Oops. Uh, I, uh, another la last piece of uh, technology is the lecture notes are typed using format lean. So just, you know, this is something that takes a lean file with comments and produce a web page that looks like that. I and mean, you've got the text and the lean code um, interlaced. And if you click on the gray areas, you see the tactic state. So you can read that on a, on a web page. So this was written for this purpose. It's, it's a hack, uh, but it's, uh, it's was good enough for, for me. And the mathematical content, so there is no new mathematical content uh, compared, to the, compared to the first semester. So I'm doing uh, stuff they've already covered uh, during the first semester, but uh, without understanding anything about the epsilon and delta. Uh, so I am more formal about logic. Uh, I, mean, I have to because uh, they haven't done any, anything, but uh, this is really not a logic course. And uh, all the uh, quantifiers and logic operators are, are introduced uh, using concrete examples. So for instance, exists, the existential quantifier is introduced using divisibility or surjectivity and, uh, and the for all uh, and implied uh, the all uh, defined using in, uh, injective function, monotone functions. And then I'm doing uh, real analysis per se, limits of sequences of real numbers. And it goes all the way up to Bolzanova Strass and I know in the, in the last uh, exercises, but only the very best students really do uh, and, and I know. And you may know uh, about all the exercises I've, I've covered last year because I, I turned them into the tutorials project that you can find on, on GitHub and uh, maybe some of you uh, did that to learn Lean. Um, the only difference is in the tutorial projects, I, uh, I, I teach some, uh, uh, power user methods like to, to, to go faster, uh, like R, in R intro and R cases and stuff like that. A bit more advanced tactics and, and golfing. But, but the content is the same as the exercises I did with my first year students last year. So the main trick is to very carefully select exercises to hide all issues uh, that have no real world analogs like coercions and casting and uh, dependent uh, types, data types. I mean, uh, for all is, is, uh, is fine, but, but no, nothing like this. And, uh, and it really takes a, a lot of work. I mean, you, you need to think carefully because uh, there, there can be uh, formalization difficulties hidden anywhere. Uh, so, so this was a huge work. 
Uh, so the first iteration two years ago uh, was too hard. So students were less prepared. So when Jeremy earlier today uh, showed the uh, student answers, they were much, much better than what I could expect from my students when they, when they start. So they, they really, I mean, they are much closer to the LSD trip uh, proof side than to Jeremy's uh, uh, student's answer. And, uh, and, and I was too ambitious. I, I went straight to the real analysis and I should have done uh, easier stuff first. And especially uh, as Jan said, uh, making connection to what they did in high school, so computation. So now you, if you read the tutorials projects, it starts with rewriting and, calc and calculations. And uh, this I didn't do the first time. So the second iteration was much better, but of course the pandemics uh, interfered. Um, and the going from lean to paper is difficult. I mean, uh, other people already explained why. So I think, uh, and also I made a, a couple of stupid mistakes in the first iteration, like explaining uh, curly brackets to focus goal. This is a huge mistake because if you forget to put a comma after a, a curly bracket, uh, closing a curly bracket, then the error message is uh, incomprehensible. So this I completely removed uh, the next year and things were much easier. So I'm very, very helpful for lean four uh, without commas and uh, brackets, it, it will be great. <laughs> and, uh, and also uh, discussing, I mean, apologizing for using type theory instead of set theory is completely pointless. I, I knew it a bit in the, in, in the beginning, and especially because Jeremy warned me, but, but it was much more than what I thought. I mean, now, every difference between set theory and type theory, I just present them as notations difference. And uh, for instance, the difference between uh, set and type uh, is completely irrelevant to first year student and it's, it's not blocking anything. Uh, that's not the issue. And so the, the main point really is this uh, difficulty to go from uh, lean proof to, to paper proof. I mean, the, uh, the students are much better at writing lean proofs in tactic mode with the context, uh, which is, uh, of course, the main point of using a proof assistant is to see this evolving context and current goal. Uh, they are much better at doing that than, uh, than at writing uh, proof uh, uh, on paper. So I think this year I will probably try uh, verbose custom tactics. So what you can see on, on this uh, screen is actually working uh, lean code. Uh, so I, I just very quickly translated this to English uh, one hour ago, uh, and the French version sounds better. But you see, you've got a, an exercise about compositions of limits to prove, and it's, it's, it reads, let's prove that on something by HF applied to epsilon H we obtain, and, and this is all valid link code uh, that works. Uh, so I, I've written uh, tactics and, and parser uh, and showing this. And, uh, and for people who don't know me, when I say I've, I've written tactics and, and, and parser code is a code name for saying that Simon Udon uh, wrote, uh, uh, I mean, helped me to, to, to write this code. And uh, so this is what I want to try this time, probably. And that's all I have to say for today. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Unsurprisingly, we are way, way over the expected time, but that's fine. We can hit into the next coffee break. I hear an echo. Somebody is... Uh, there, it's better. Um, so yeah, so I want to open the floor to questions from the audience now. Questions for the whole panel, questions for specific people. Um, we've gotten a lot of messages here. A few people talked about how some students like it and some students don't. Um, what kind of numbers does, like, how many people <laughs> like the lean Marmite? So I can say that in, in logic and proof, most students seem to like it. So some really love it. I mean, I, I'm, so I'm at Carnegie Mellon, uh, but, uh, uh, but I'm in the philosophy department. So I'm in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. So these are students that are kind of technically inclined, but, but they're not, they're, they're, they're uh, I mean, I, get, I do get some math and computer science majors, but also many others. Um, but uh, uh, so, some of them absolutely love it. Um, very, so I mean, I, I do set up, you know, questionnaires, you know, at the end of, of, of every year and, and uh, um, I'd say almost none say, you know, I, I express sort of a, a strong animosity. Some, some like it less, some struggle with it a little bit more, but, uh, um, but, but I, is I it advertised as part of the deal? deal? I mean, it's it presumably advertised as part of the deal. Right? It's in the course description. I warned them, right? And the very first lecture I said, we're going to do these three things. So yeah, they're, they're forewarned. I also have a, 
I mean, I have feedback from the student. I mean, official feedback that there is a poll at the end of the. And unfortunately, I didn't prepare, uh, so, so I, I couldn't show this because I, I, I didn't prepare this. But uh, I mean, I think more than half of my students were happy, and some of them, I don't know, maybe on on 50 students last year, I, I guess maybe four of them really loved it and, and one of them the, became a contributor to math Lib, which is not at all a goal of, of my course but this happened anyway and, and this happened despite the fact that it was a manda mandatory course for them so there is no uh, optional uh, course so no, i think it's uh, i mean they like it i mean the, the first iteration was harder because but not because of lean because the mathematics were was too difficult and then they couldn't get over the learning lean stuff on top of going too fast on the mathematics your students they had to go to your course and they had to do lean right yeah yeah, well, yeah. I but only, it... so only those 50 students who are enrolled in this uh, uh, who are selected uh, for a, a double major in math and computer science and, and are good students who i mean who declare that they they want to work more because they, they take uh, courses in mathematics and computer science and that, that's in total that more courses that what normal students are, are meant to take so they, they are motivated because you said you thought you'd started you started with analysis the first time you did it and you thought that was starting too high whereas it seemed to me that heather also started with analysis but then again heather made it optional yeah there are also advantages to analysis like the nice thing about analysis is that you import the real numbers at the start of every file. You don't need anything more. The like you sort of have the same style of proof over and over again. Whereas, like in a more logic-focused course, you actually have to teach many different styles of proof, inductions, and and cases, and 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 clever tricks and so on. With the reals, you 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 can get very good at that same style of unfold the definitions, you know, fill in the quantifiers, proof, and do it enough that the students become comfortable with it. Uh, what really didn't work with me were the purely logical exercises like proof the Morgan laws. I mean, they were, they were, for us, it was completely pointless. They couldn't understand what there, were to, what there was to prove. And it was completely alien. There's no, no relation at all with anything they did in, in mathematics course. And, uh, and I tried that in the first year uh, and first iteration as well. So I just stopped doing that completely. <laughs> Well, no yeah. I think that may be why Yihan uh, Marasinga was saying that you should start with informal arguments at the beginning. Yeah, which is not what I did. So <laughs> I guess right, I started, right. But I started, I've been yeah. teaching a I've been teaching a foundations of mathematics class yeah. that's a transition class for many years here at Rala in uh, Missouri, and uh, we uh, I have always used my own notes and started off with the students having to do informal arguments at the board in front of everybody else and getting feedback from everybody in the class. And, and we, in fact, I don't begin by telling them what an argument is. They're supposed to argue in order to find out what an argument is and what a proof is. So that seems to work really well in terms of getting them to find out why you need to know things like De Morgan's Law. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I, have a, I have a question. Um, uh, we're talking about, I, I mean, one of the things that's very interesting is, uh, and I would like to, to take the opportunity to thank to, to people that make the material available. So the logic and proofs are, are, are very nice material, mathematics and lean, uh, the hint can guide, all of this help a lot. Uh, I'm teaching discrete math and using lean for for the first part, logic, the part of logic, basically following the logic and proof. And then one of the, the most difficult part for me is the graph. I made a lot of questions about this in the Zulip uh, in the past. So one of the things that's not well developed is this part of graph. Um, but one, co one question that I have is what about these new way uh, of teaching in remotely uh, environments. What are the specific experience that people had with that? For example, for me, I thought that uh, I made some videos and my impression is that uh, videos work better than the, the Zoom uh, interactive uh, class. 
but sometimes, of course, we have students that didn't watch the video, didn't pay attention to that. So how, how people solve this problem of being, trying to be, because I think that all this, this pandemic also give us the opportunity to be more productive, right? Produce materials to be more productive in, for the next years. So any thoughts about this? You were talking about Zoom and I had already been using in my classes of this kind. Um, the students are required to make videos and upload them for their classmates to peer review and for me to review and for us to discuss. And these, these uh, videos show them solving the problem or discussing the material intuitively. What do the axioms mean to you? Um, how much do you understand about them and things like that? Which ones do you understand? Which ones do you not understand? Uh, what questions do you have? And they have to answer each other before I take any uh, action to try to answer anything so that I can see what kind of answers they're giving as well to each other. Um, not, uh, so they can use Zoom to create these videos, by the way, and then upload them. And this expands the classroom so that homework is something that the students interact with as if they were in person, but a little bit different because it's a presentation. So I, so I just I taught using logic and proof this past semester. Um, and uh, um, uh, I, I tried to make the, the classes as close as possible to what I would do in a classroom. So they were just regular lectures and they just happened to be uh, by Zoom. And actually with Lean, it, it worked well. It was very easy to kind of switch over. Um, and, you know, and it's, I mean, look, holding somebody's attention by Zoom for, you know, an hour, an hour and 20 minutes, it's, it's hard. I mean, sometimes I would break, you know, 10, 10 minutes early when I saw that I was really losing people. But for the most part, you know, people were about as zoned out by the end of the lecture as they, as they you know, would have been if I had been doing it in person. So I, I, I didn't sense a huge, huge discrepancy between, um, you know, kind of classroom and, and, and on Zoom. So my answer to that is so, so the, the course that I described is has almost no lecturing part. I and mean, it's like and sometimes I, I talk for 10 minutes at the beginning of the lecture, then everything is in the exercise files and the lecture notes they, they can read at home if they want, but everything is covered in the comments in the in the lean files. And and really the almost whole two hours is students trying to uh, do the exercises and talking to each other and, and talking to me in the computer lab. And uh, remotely, it's a nightmare because I mean, they are the, the good students that are motivated and have good condition at home uh, and a good internet connection and, and they don't have uh, three little brothers yelling around them. Uh, I mean, they can have a, a great time, especially because there are so few of them that have more time for them. Uh, and half of the students basically disappeared completely uh, during this remote teaching. And, uh, and what is very difficult, when you're in the computer lab, you can walk around the room and you see who is stuck. And remotely, it's much harder to go. And I mean, you, you need to click, even on CoCalc, uh, to click uh, several times to go and watch what the student is doing. And if, it's, uh, if the student is not doing anything, you don't know if it's because of an internet problem or if it's because it's doing something else. Uh, so I think we shouldn't spend too much time on the specifics of, of the pandemics because hopefully uh, this won't last forever. But, uh, but no, it was very difficult making uh, and teaching this remotely. Okay. I, I certainly found that to be the case as well. It was uh, very challenging. Uh, my students did find, I think they preferred the, uh, the live sessions as in, rather than the videos because I, often I would, in the live sessions I would, say uh, a question a student would ask me a question about something that they should have seen in the video and I hadn't seen it because they can ask questions in the live sessions not so much in the videos. Were there uh, well, 250 the people in the live sessions? Uh, well there should have been no no sorry no not uh, well in some of them yes but there were other sessions in which the cohort was split into three groups so there were different sizes of cohorts yeah. And were they doing live lean coding then or was it? Or was uh, in these the yes thing? in the smaller groups yes in the the groups of that were split into three yeah, where there were three cohorts, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they, I broke them into smaller groups for group group work. So groups of 10 working together. Groups of the, 10? Yeah. 
Okay, uh, can I ask a question about the videos? So were these videos of like a normal lec lecture length or did somebody try, for instance, to make short, short, shorter videos and uh, like giving only an overview or a more condensed version of a lecture? For my case, I, I, I made short videos for one, two examples. Uh, I think that works better than all videos. I did exactly the same. When I was teaching with Logic and Proof, I think it worked much, much better than one lectures. I've had a funny experience where if you present one hour long video lectures, then the students know that they can pause you. So they take three or four hours to watch it and they get completely bogged down because they're doing this in a number of courses and it's, it's unsustainable. Somehow it's better if they can just fail to understand you during the lecture and move on with their lives. <laughs> So I would also make kind of 10 minute lean lectures when I was doing, I did an optional lean component with my course like Heather, but with 250 people like Gihan, and I would just make 10 minutes, brief 10 minute lean only things. I've got a question for Julien, uh, because I tried Educera, uh, I think four years ago. And the reason I didn't try to use Educera uh, is because when I was doing the exercises, mm -hmm. I, I realized that myself, I was doing brute force clicking uh, to, to, uh, to solve the exercises. Uh, and the reason I was doing brute force clicking is because I was frustrated because I, I could see a statement uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, of, the, of a lemma and I had a proof in my head, I mean, a formal proof, uh, but, but then the, the, the lemmas or the deduction rules that were available in the given exercises were not the one I needed. And so I couldn't, uh, I couldn't write a proof uh, in Educera because of this. And, and then I was upset and I, I started clicking everywhere. And I thought that if I was clicking randomly, then probably the students w would do it. And, uh, and how, do, how did you manage that? I mean, were you able to avoid this problem somehow? Or? Uh, for the exercises we are doing, I think it's not a big problem because there are not so many different solutions but uh, i agree that it's a big uh, problem of educura that you cannot add your own lemmas so yeah. we had this project inside the logipedia project of gildawek of trying to make an open source version uh, of educura uh, where we could, would fix that but, yeah. uh, yes i agree that currently it can be frustrating but i guess it's the same if you are using lean or cox. Sometimes there is something obvious on paper yeah. that you have a time proving. And yeah. I mean, of, of course, I mean, it's also frustrating, but, but somehow in, in, when you're using the proof assistant directly, you, you cannot quite randomly click. Although, I mean, we have only a finite list of tactics. So I've definitely, I've seen students just randomly try and type the tactics uh, names and see what works. The great thing about real analysis is that n linear rift does everything. <laughs> <laughs> but is that a good thing or not? <laughs> it, it's like uh, what, what Julien was saying, that sometimes uh, the student can apply the tactic but not prove the theory themselves. But uh, yeah. Uh, Julien, are you teaching I mean, mathematicians or computer scientists, Julien? Uh, first year students are both. It's uh, two mm. thirds of computer scientists and one third of math. Just to say to Patrick, that's how I learned to use Lean. I didn't really read any of the material. I mean, some of them weren't created, but I just, you know, I would try apply when I should have done exact. I would try intro, you know, and just repetition and noticing, oh, I need to do intro when there's a fraud. Like that's, that's kind of learning. I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's such a bad thing that people do random. Yeah, except that I want, I want to, I want them to be able to write a proof on paper at the end of the semester. <laughs> also, and on paper, you, I mean, sometimes they, they do write random things, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, but they don't have the immediate feedback. So, so we get the LSD uh, trip yeah. proof. So there's evidence so, that this is not actually teaching them to become better paper and pencil mathematicians. Mm -hmm. we have, we're I seeing anecdotal become, evidence. I, I hope that at least some of them become somewhat better. I mean, and they tell me that they feel they understand the game better. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they're also very good students who were already able to, to write correct proofs at the beginning of the course, but they feel that they, they are very happy that they know what they're doing now. And hopefully this is also helpful. 
and uh, you yeah, know I think I think the, there is progress and uh, and we I try with those uh, uh, fake natural language tactics to see mm, yes, it's easier brilliant. for them to uh, yeah to that would be an interesting uh, yeah can I can I just say as a student who kind of went through uh, Kevin's uh, in kind of introduction to uni maths course that like I think uh, Patrick your idea of making more verbo uh, verbose tactics mm -hmm. is going to be really good because like part of the the really high initial barrier of getting into lean as as well as like because part of the problem is developing this concept of rigor right and like in lean that's very solid but I think the the barrier is this translation in between and I think by making the language more verbose you're reducing that barrier so I think that's going to have some really at so, least increase the engagement, I think. So, so no, I want to I wanna emphasize that I want to emphasize that I don't think lean should be a replacement for the old fashioned way of teaching. I mean, you should also have them also write pen and paper proofs and then yeah, you mark yeah. them and you tell them all the things that they're yeah. doing wrong and stylistically. So it's not supposed to be a replacement. It's supposed to be a compliment. Yeah. You know, I, I'm going to teach it this coming term. I'm going to teach a replacement course. <laughs> I'm, teaching, <laughs> I'm teaching PhD students. I who know all the stuff already and else, so yeah. then i'm just going to make yeah. them learn you know relearn undergraduate mathematics in lean mm -hmm. so, so, uh, well, I think there is. so what it, i'd say oh yeah sorry what i'd say is that for my students one of the major stumbling blocks when they start off is just being able to pass mathematical statements or even to realize that there are such things as statements mathematical statements because they're used to dealing with expressions not statements yeah. everything is is an expression right so when they do a proof by induction often they, they're not really realizing that there's some predicate that you're you know assuming holds for you know some end or what have you they, they just deal with expressions and then try to manipulate these expressions and it just doesn't make any sense at all so even even though it's the case that yes lean really helps you because it's it's telling you what the context is you need to do the first step of actually passing the the statement uh in order to I, realize yeah, i have I, yeah. have I have huge hopes that these new widgets that were not available last year when, when mm. I did my course, they will also help with parsing statements because there is mm. this uh, dynamic highlighting of uh, sub-expressions. And I, I hope I'll be able to use that a lot uh, to, to help them parsing statements. And, and I wanted to emphasize that the, the point of my verbose tactics uh, uh, with words is, is not to lower the entry to uh, writing lean, the barrier to, to, to writing lean. It's, it's really lowering the barrier to exiting lean, going from lean proof <laughs> to uh, paper. Uh, I see, I see. Because, I see. because really the, the students are much better at uh, writing lean proofs than at translating uh, lean proofs uh, into uh, on paper. Even yep. with, with the uh, tactic state, I mean, with the evolving tactic state is, is not enough. I mean, seeing the uh, tactics written and the evolving static, uh, tactic state is, is not helping them so much writing proofs on paper. The, the evolving, evolving tactic state is helping them tremendously during the proof, but not during the translation back to, to paper. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting point, Patrick, because if you take the computer science perspective, in the past, people tried different languages that tried to, to be more uh, 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 natural language oriented, or even maybe abstractions like the turtle in basic language, those kind of things that people draw in the screen. And the experience that in computer science we had is that that does, didn't make people better programmers. Actually, the, the, this didn't help them, right? So in, in, in the end, trying to hide them from the complex of the language and the abstractions from the programming language was not as far as I can see, was not a very successful in teaching people to program. So it's that, 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 that point that you just made was interesting. So you are not trying to, uh, to facilitate them to, to understand link is the other way around. So in that sense, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I was actually very surprised that students picked up lean so well. I mean, when I started uh, three years ago, when I started this uh, course, I was not sure at all they could do any lean, and I was ready uh, to just give up on lean after three weeks. I mean, it could have been a disaster. I, I was ready to switch to a completely traditional uh, uh, logic and, and proof uh, course uh, without lean after a couple of weeks if it was a disaster. Uh, but even the first iteration, 
where I, I made many wrong choices with the order of the material and the pace uh, of the course. Even this first iteration uh, was not a disaster when it came to writing lean proofs. But for, but for your propose this, so this, the, these tools that uh, I, I, I can't remember who, who was the author of that, but there is a, a tool that we can produce a web, web page from, a, from, from a theorem and a proof, right? And you can read Patrick. it. Patrick. <laughs> <That's, that's laughs> okay. So <laughs> I was uh, helping okay. you. <laughs> so don't you think that this is more, <laughs> more useful than right, having these, this language that you showed to us? I mean, having these task language that you showed to us? I mean, the guy wrote the proof and then produced the, 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 the page and we would be we're able to read the proof in a more natural language. No, because I mean, you need to write the comments. I mean, the, the comments are not auto generated. Right? It, it, it's like the, the source lean file has, the, has both the traditional writing and, and, the, and the tactics uh, in it. So I don't know. I never tried to make them uh, use this directly. I mean, of course, I, I told them they could first add comments to their lean code before going to the translation on the paper. But, uh, and I, I, I have a comment or a question, I guess. Uh, the, the efforts to make lean come closer to the language of mathematics. There, there's been several attempts and one of them is this controlled natural language. But what I see that's very interesting in Patrick's approach is just to take the syntax of lean and make it a bit closer and more acceptable to, to in order to facilitate the entry and the exit from lean. And I think that's, a, that's an important point because uh, we're focused on the mathematics and the lean is supposed to be a tool rather than you know, in computer science, the focus is on getting students to program in an unnatural computer language. So yeah. Yeah, it's quite different. And yeah, I'll, I'll remark the notations in Lean are very helpful. I think uh, the the first pair of students I had who worked in Coq, one later moved with me to Lean and was absolutely astonished and blown away by the for all with an upside down uh, A and <laughs> this is a big for the deal. real numbers. I mean, yeah, uh, Unicode I, is a I liked big this, deal. but uh, he liked it even more. And it, it really, I think, helps uh, make it accessible to, to, to the, the newcomers. Computer right. scientists I'll, don't I'll seem to buy that. that. In, in logic, scientists it's, just think it's a, just a, you know, just a gimmick in some sense. Yeah. But for mathematicians, it makes a huge difference. And, and just... logic and proof, we only use uh, we only use term proofs. Um, I mean, the only tactic we are, we use is rewrite, you know, to do equational reasoning. And again, that only works for very elementary proofs. But the the point is that you just want students to, you know, assume this, have this, show that it's you know by cases this. It's really just kind of term. So term proofs are a little bit closer to natural language. And so the hope is that if you show them the term proofs, and you work on ordinary natural language proofs, you know, side by side that there they can see the, the correspondence. So again, yeah. it's gonna limit how far you can get with that approach, um, but that's as far as we use it in logic and proof. Yeah, that's interesting, Jeremy, because when I use logic and proof and they start to be comfortable with term provers, proofs, then when the natural number games, I, I had to spend a couple of uh, classes to, to actually uh, make people aware of the task mode and, and understand what's going on because they are so accommodated to think in term, term mode. So that, that's my experience. And usually people thinking other way around, right? If you start with that, then term, term mode will be kind of automatic to learn, I don't know, but uh, from term to task, I thought that was hard. May I, may I add a more profane uh, uh, barrier that, that, that also stops me from sometimes from using lean uh, uh, just, uh, just quickly in a course is that when, when I, I have to, uh, when, when students have to uh, install lean, they have to deal with a lot of things that mathematics students don't know about. Like they have to know about GitHub, about, no. you know what? And there's so many problems that can occur. When, when on the other hand, when I, when I see cock, I just have to, and mind you, mind you, most of my students will be Windows users. Maybe eighty percent will be Windows users. When I when I teach a course, I have an assistant, and 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 I can teach a lab not offline, but but uh, uh, but but directly. My assistant can can tell them, okay, do that, do that, uh, to help them in, uh, install the system. 
But now in, in this uh, situation, when I, I have to tell them, well, install that, and many people will have troubles. They will get caught in a, in a problem and they will send me an email and they want help with installing. With Cock Ede, it's so e easy. I tell them, well, install Cock Ede and everybody is happy. And those people who, who, who work on Linux, they will have no problem. But those people, those 80% that, that use Windows, they will have a problem installing. Uh, uh, so uh, again, that is, again, that is one of the, the big, the, the big uh, hurdles uh, that, uh, that, that we forget. And, and, and in comparison to that, for many people, the logic is rather easy. Now, again, for my students, installing everything, Lean, VS Code, and the library, and is just unpacking one folder. I mean, on my website, they click on the link, they get a zip file, they unzip the link file, and inside the unzip folder, there is uh, one thing which is called uh, by the name of my course, and they double click on that, and it works. I mean, it just launches VS Code and uh, open in the right folder, and with Lean, uh, everything is in the same folder. VS they don't Code, need to have Lean. VS Code installed first. Hmm? It's no, installed no, they don't VS install Code. No, 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 they don't install VS Code first. Uh, this is the, the fully bundled approach. And they have one folder on, on their hard drive containing VS Code, Lean, MathLib, and the exercises they have to do. Is that for every operating? I mean, how's that? Is that is it for every operating system, or how do you? But I, I don't know if we still have those on on the website because it seems they, like they are still on the website, and they are for every operating system. Uh, the yeah. The Mac version has had minor issues in the past, but I think it was resolved and nobody's reported that it's broken now. Yeah. Well, so you, you, you can uh, distribute this. So of course, they, they won't have a fully working uh, Lean environment. They, they won't have Lean project. They won't have Elan. Uh, they, they, have, they will have a fixed version of Lean with a fixed version of MathLib. So I, I use a completely frozen Lean plus MathLib. I mean, at the end of January, whatever the state of Lean 3 and MathLib will be, for my students, it will be the stay the state of Lean and MathLib until uh, May. And uh, so, yeah, this is this is all bundled. And there I is mean, no installation, a, uh, only unzipping a, a folder, no, no installation at all. So we have the installation in Amsterdam with two or three platforms, uh, but, you know, with clear instructions. And you're you're teaching no computer problem. scientists. Yeah. So well, there were difference. some. You're you're right, but I mean, don't overestimate my students either. <laughs> I mean, it's a mix. It's a mixed bag, and uh, uh, on three platforms, and also some of them were mathematicians. So, because uh, Professor Gaum is teaching mathematicians. So, uh, are there? Uh, uh, I I want to ask a kind of unrelated question. So, if if there's more discussion about this, please. Maybe not. Okay. Um, I'm interested in uh, hearing about any experience people had in teaching more higher level courses. I know Kevin, for example, you taught algebraic geometry, right? Again, only mean? very informally. It, it was just, you know, a class of 20 and it was just like, here's some stuff, you know, I'm going to be proving the null stuff and that's, but I'm going to be goofing around doing it in lean too. And just, I yeah, I have just the same experience as Heather. I have one or two people interested, but the, the majority not. I, this, I, I never quite, I'm very unsure about whether it's too difficult to teach the mathematics and the lean at the same time. I'd be interested in Heather's comments on this. You were teaching people new mathematics, but also how to use lean simultaneously. Do you think that's so maybe, just too maybe much? I can give some, uh, maybe I can give some context. I'm, I'm teaching a commutative algebra course this term and there's gonna be some component in category theory also in homological algebra and commutative algebra. And I'm looking at my students, it seems like about half of them are computer science, math, double majors. So I think um, I may, I was thinking of doing something similar to what Heather mentioned about optional uh, lean components, uh, but I'm concerned. But that works for me. I mean, so you, you make it extra credit so that they really feel they're not losing anything. They can sacrifice but, but, what regular work problem a week in exchange for doing the lean or, or something like that. So in general, I think when you use lean for teaching, um, the, the, the key to success 
is using it in very restricted ways. So in other words, if you can find theorems in algebraic geometry where you can basically show them, you know, six tactics, you know, apply intro and so on, and, you know, a library of 10 theorems, and then you give them, you know, an example of things you can prove with those 10 theorems, and then you give them, you know, uh, other things that you can prove with those same 10 theorems. I mean, if you can kind of restrict the context so that they don't need to know every little bit of syntax and every bit of the library and all these crazy tactics, and when norm num comes up, but, you know, they need that, but you haven't shown it to them. You know, if you can find things that, that you know, again, keep the number of rules, the number, that, if you can keep the context restricted enough, then there's a lot you can do. I mean, there's a lot you can do with just a few commands. I mean, that's the, the, that's the whole, you know, the joy of the, the natural numbers game, right? There are just, you know, a few commands and then you're just off and running. There's a lot to keep you. So if you can, if you can find that context of, uh, you know, figuring out what you can do without having to know everything. Um, I mean, I think that's, that's the key to success. You don't want to have too many tactics and you don't want to have uh, coerc coercion issues and, and dependent types. And for instance, Adam, for you, I think, you would need you would need to use polynomials and polynomials are not easy uh, in, yeah uh, right. or in any proof assistant i guess because i mean this is funny you see i i feel, i'm also teaching in just regular courses and, and this year i am teaching a algebra course and i and i explain i mean formally uh, polynomials and uh, and uh, rings and localization and, and stuff like that I'm, I'm teaching that without any lean or any proof assistant and now I'm aware of how many uh, implicit maps and identifications and inclusion there are everywhere. And, and I'm not surprised that polynomials are, are not fun in, in math lean because indeed they involve a lot of uh, implicit maps. I was toying with the idea of doing linear algebra and decided that it's the bases and the coordinates and the identification between coordinates and different bases and so on would make it intractable at the undergraduate level, but I'd like to be proved wrong. Adam, I should show you some of the me struggling with multivariable polynomials, just doing very basic things like morphism of algebraic varieties is the same as a morphism of the coordinate rings. This was astonishingly tricky to do the, the way I set it up. Polynomials are hard. And yeah, analysis, especially with tools like Linares, it's, it can be much easier. But one thing I might be thinking about in terms of the future is that you have a, a set of uh, lean literate undergraduates, maybe they've even learned lean at school, and they come to university and they use MathLib to learn maths, right? because they already know lean. They go to MathLib, they want to learn about, uh, I don't know, um, something in topology, you know, what is an open set or something. They, they, go, they go to MathLib, they experiment with MathLib, you don't actually need a, a textbook or, or what have you. Can, I think that's one great thing about Lean. You can actually find out about mathematical structures by playing with Lean. I think, I think that's a wonderful... I, I think this is a wonderful note to end on, um, a, a very helpful note for the future. Um, we've now eaten our entire coffee break, and I would like a quick break for the next session. Um, so first, let's thank our panelists, uh, and let's continue this discussion on Zulip as well. Thanks. Um, the things I wanted to bring up that